Okay. Linda, are you not seeing us anymore? Right. Can I click where it says got it? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. You got it here. Perfect. Very good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. We are going to be starting on the sixth letter, which is on page 79. It actually doesn't have a page number on it. So go to 80 and go one back and you'll be at 79. And before we uh, dive into the text, um, any old business, anything that uh, anybody wanted to uh, bring up, talk about before we dive into new material, anything that's been percolating for the last week? I... I... I'm wondering if I'm in the right book right now. Um, it is uh, following. No, it's not. That's the old book. We are in the practice of the presence of God, Linda. Thank you. I don't know if I had it. Okay. Well, then the... just listen along. And uh... Dave, I'm I'm on a different page than you are. I uh, I don't. That's sort of been the story of our lives, though, William. But I mean, uh, I feel like you skipped a bunch of stuff. My last page was on page 57. Oh, you are yeah, so mine, right. Mine shows that it's 59. I yeah. am so, I'm so sorry. I looked at, at page 60 and I saw 80. So, yes, we're on page 59. Thank you, William. Right. <laughs> you are absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I do need a new prescription for these glasses. It's uh, <laughs> it's getting a little dicey these days. Uh, All right. So uh, nothing that anybody wants to talk about before we dive in? Okay. So a new letter. We're back to um, him writing to the Reverend Mother. And uh, I, we don't know if it's the same Reverend Mother or a different Reverend Mother. His first three letters were to a Reverend Mother who would have been the um, the leader of a, of a convent, leader of a a group of nuns and uh, this one is very short and so we can look i'm thinking we're going to get through two letters tonight but let's see how we do but to the reverend mother and rever reverend and most honored mother although my prayers are of little value you will not be without them so here is classic brother lawrence always self-deprecating right reverend although my prayers are of little value you will not be without them I promised you that I will keep my word. How happy we would be if we could find the treasure of which the gospel speaks. All else would be as nothing. It is boundless. The more you search for it, the greater the riches are the riches you will find. Let us search unceasingly and let us not stop until we have found it. He then speaks of several private matters after which he goes on to say. So there's a, a lot more to this letter that has been edited out because it is uh, the editor believes it is not of value to us. And finally, Reverend Mother, I do not know what I shall become. It seems peace of soul and tranquility of spirit come to me even in sleep. If I were capable of suffering, there would be none for me to have. And if I were allowed, I would gladly submit to the sufferings of purgatory, which I would endure in reparation for my sins. I know only that God protects me. I am in a state of tranquility so sublime that I fear nothing. What could I fear when I am with him? I hold fast to him as much as I can. May he be blessed by all. Amen. That's the, the whole letter as far as we've got it. Okay, so there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff in here that's cultural that we're going to need to take a look at. Um, starting with the first paragraph, he's always downplaying himself. There's that humility almost to a fault. And so, although the prayers are of little value, he's going to keep his word and he's going to keep praying for her. If this is the same Reverend Mother as the first three letters, she was going through a real crisis of faith at the time, some kind of dark night of the soul. It was never specified but it was obvious in the letters that he was trying to bolster her. He was trying to keep her on the path of presence. They obviously had a relationship before and had discussed his way of practicing presence. And, uh, and he saw her as a kindred spirit. Uh, then she's going through this difficult time and he's trying to bolster. So we don't know if it's the same one, but he's still praying for her, at least this woman as well. And then how happy we'd be if we could find the treasure of which the gospel speaks. 
all else would be as nothing. It is boundless. The more you search for it, the greater are the riches you will find. Let us search unceasingly and let us not stop until we have found it. So he's referring to the treasure in the field parable that Jesus tells. The man finds the treasure in the field. He says, first of all, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A man try, finds a treasure in the field and over the joy that he feels over this treasure, you know, he puts it back, first of all, into the field. And then he goes off and sells everything he has so that he can buy the field. And we've talked about this uh, several times. It seems kind of backwards to us. You already have the treasure. Why not just run? Take the treasure and run. Why do we need to go put it back, sell everything we have and buy the field so that we can have the treasure? And of course, this is all second half of life stuff, right? First half of life is about acquisition. So the first half of life person is going to take the treasure and run. That's what we do. We acquire something that is outside of ourselves. And then we make ourselves whole by finding this thing that we can bring to ourselves because we have we are less than and need this acquisition in order to make ourselves whole. What Jesus is talking about is second half of life perspective which is about relinquishment, not about acquisition. So in order to gain the kingdom, we have to sell everything that we have. We have to let go of this. So it's exactly the opposite of what we would think. Now, what he's talking here, he's talking about still finding something. Yeah. But the way he talks about it is really interesting because he's talking about it being absolutely boundless and that we're going to search unceasingly. And one of the interesting things about that notion is, does that unceasingly, does that boundlessness, does that infinite nature of the kingdom extend beyond death? Is there still more to be had even after we die? We typically think in Christian theology that as soon as we die, heaven is a, a steady state. Heaven is a state of everything being completely fulfilled. There's nothing left to gain. But if Brother Lawrence is right that the kingdom is boundless, then we're never going to reach the end of it. We're never going to reach the bottom. Just some interesting thoughts on my head. Um, any comments about all this? I was really glad that you said that because when I was thinking about the parable, I thought the reason that he wouldn't take the treasure is because it really didn't belong to him. So he wasn't going to take that treasure until he bought the field. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have recognized what you were talking about that. Uh, and, and so it's like, okay, what is he letting go of to gain the treasure? Well, he's, he's selling everything to gain the treasure. Mm -hmm. And then he says, not, let us not stop until we have found it. And it's got to be the treasure, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Everything. How happy we would be if we could find the treasure, which the gospel speaks. All else would be as nothing. In other words, once you have this, this treasure of the kingdom, then everything else that we have lived to acquire, everything else that we have held dear, everything else that, that we identify with that has come to define us becomes as nothing in comparison to this, this treasure. And of course, what is the treasure? If Brother Lawrence was answering that question, what would he say? What is the treasure? Just the presence of God. Absolutely. It's the presence of God. Everything that he does is about the presence of God. Nothing else matters. There's no other there there. Once, once you have the presence, then you know that, that moment is completely fulfilled. And so there's nothing else to be gained. It's just the presence itself that he is after. He says that over and over again in these letters. And so, yes, the treasure is the presence. So once you have, you are experiencing the presence, everything else is as if nothing. Nothing else can really be contained in that moment when you're fully present to it. But of course, you come in and out of that focus with the presence, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's always more to be gained in terms of us coming back to presence and gleaning more and, and seeing new facets or new depths. I suppose, of God's presence and nature. And so there's always more to be discovered. It's as if you turn the corner and it's always something new. I remember driving up the, the, the uh, western coast of the United States all the way to Vancouver um, when, I was, uh, when I was a kid. 
And we had two friends and we drove right up the coast in, in my little Mazda pickup truck. And as we were going through the Oregon coast, I remember every Vista point, it was like, this is the most beautiful stretch of coastline I've seen yet. And then you turn the next Vista point. No, no, this is the most beautiful one. No, no, <laughs> this one is. And it's just like, it was, you know, Vista after Vista was just more spectacular than the last. That's the kind of the way that I envision uh, coming to know God is that every time we encounter God, every time we immerse ourselves back in presence, it's the most beautiful vista that you can imagine. But there's always another one in the next moment coming. And I don't think we ever exhaust that. And to me, heaven as a steady state um, is going to last me about 15 minutes, and then I'm going to be bored out of my gourd. But uh, God as an infinite well of experience and, and new experience uh, is a completely different animal. When we talk about the Aramaic, remember um, the eternal life in Aramaic, Haye uh, de Alma, doesn't mean an infinite amount of time. What, what it actually means is this moment right now that is always an infinitely diverse and alive and ever-changing and satisfying. It's this moment right now, but you never exhaust it. <clears throat> it never becomes boring. It never becomes stale. It's always new and alive and regenerating. That's the idea of eternal life if you put it back into the Aramaic. I think that's what Brother Lawrence is tapping into here. And he's talking about it just always bringing something new. And yes, he's talking about finding it as if he doesn't have it now and needs to find it. But we know that Brother Lawrence is always finding it. Now, he says there are times that he does move out of focus, but then that God's spirit draws him back in again. So there's an oscillation even to Brother Lawrence's experience of presence. And that's where I think he's trying to draw us into as well. But always something new, always something that just makes everything else as if it's nothing. Now that's an eternity I can I can live with. I think the closest thing I've gotten to that is, you know, after my husband passed, I was sitting right here where I'm sitting. And I thought, he used to give me a bad time that he was going to bring our dump trailer back over to the house and he'd always go beep, beep, beep. And I get so mad. And then I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, how much of this stuff is his? And I started, so the kitchen, yes, because he cooked. <laughs> Basically the garage, six feet in the, in our closet, the master closet and the kitchen. And I so badly wanted to put a pop tart in the toaster. If there's any firefighters listening, I didn't do it. I so badly wanted to take my paints and my photos out of the house and burn the dang thing down. It became so burdensome to think that all of this belonged to me and to think that when he passed, everything was left behind. Everything, everything non-essential other than me. Mm. Everything, you know. <laughs> everything was left behind you know what i'm saying and it 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 didn't matter no. that's the closest i would say that really truly of looking at everything going oh my gosh what am i doing with all this stuff and it's really become burdensome have i gotten rid of everything no and it's been five years <laughs> I'm telling you that no. but i want to be like that where it's more peaceful because when i'm running my business i was just thinking about this right today i was thinking you know, that you get into the, the rat race of, well, I want to build, I want to build, I want to build. And then I come back and then I go, why, why, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so I oscillate. You remember the, uh, we talk, always talk about the four S's of contemplation. So it's silence, solitude, stillness, and simplicity. Everything in contemplation is driving us towards simplicity. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about, Laurie. And I think it's what Brother Lawrence is talking about. And of course, Jesus says, you know, all you got to do is seek the kingdom. Seek the kingdom first, which we know is God's presence, right? The experience of God's presence is kingdom. Seek that first, God's righteousness, which again is unity. So the connection, the unity of presence, and all else will be added. 
simplicity. One thing that we need to do. It's kind of like you had one job, right? You had one job. That's all you got to do. Mm -hmm. Just seek the presence and everything else comes into focus. And I think it starts to right size our priorities with all the stuff that we need to deal with, all the details, all the accumulation of things. It starts to right size. And that doesn't mean that we're going to get rid of all our things. We need some things. Maybe we don't need all of the things, but we need things while we're breathing here. And if you've got kids, you need a lot of things. That's just the way it is, right? But it also reprioritizes. We're no longer identified with those things. That idea of mammon in, in the New Testament, it's not just wealth. It are the things that we pile up in our lives that come to define us, that we identify with. That's the mammon, the stuff that we are now clinging to and relying on rather than God's presence. And so letting go of that is the, is the ticket. But again, trying to live your life as a negative doesn't work. We can't live our lives with trying to push out the things we don't want. Seek first the kingdom. Keep coming back to God's presence, and those things will be displaced in your life naturally. It doesn't mean we don't have them at all anymore, but they won't define us anymore. We won't identify with them. More and more, we will be identified with God's spirit and God's presence, and that's where we want to go. Making sense? Mm -hmm. Any other comments before we move on? Okay. Got a thumbs up from Marina. That's good. <laughs> I had a reaction to the seeking, the ceaseless seeking, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it, I, 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 I think I know where he was going, like, like just seeking the presence of God, not because when I read that, it almost felt like, like my client who went back to Hawaii trying to regain that experience and end up relapsing on alcohol because mm. he was seeking this peak experience that was somehow eluding him. Um, in our session today, we were talking about the idea that, you know, maybe the people who are the most deeply spiritual are the people who never think about God at all. You know, you know I, that's a really good point to make, William. That's a really good point to make. At least not thinking about him in a theological way. You know, mm. just experience, wordlessly experiencing God's presence is so much more valuable than thinking about God. Right. Because then you're in the flow. Of, I, so I'm, I think I'm right with you if that's what you meant. Mm -hmm. that's very that's very cool and you know seeking unfortunately for us especially as modern westerners we read this this ceaseless seeking this uh, you know this searching unceasingly um is is maybe a, an unfortunate image for us that, that conjures up of an unfortunate image because we're again back into acquisition mode we're thinking we, we're seeking something that we can acquire but Brother Lawrence already has the thing that he's seeking. He already understands what it is. He knows where it is, right? <laughs> he knows the only thing that matters is God's presence, and he knows exactly where it is. Now, think about the parable that Jesus told. The man finds the treasure in the field. He knows exactly where it is. He's not searching for it anymore. And yet, he has to do all this work to sell everything that he has so that he can buy the field. So it's still about relinquishment. The, the truth of the matter is, is there's nothing out there for us that will complete us. It's already here. It's already within the kingdom. Jesus said it's not out there to, to be found by observation. It's within. It's entos in the Greek, which means within, among, and in the midst of all at the same time. We know exactly where it is. Trouble is, it's covered over with all the stuff that is blocking our view of the pure simplicity of the presence of God. So our seeking is really the ongoing process of relinquishment. It's taking the stuff off layer by layer because my stone not yet smooth. I don't know about yours, but you know, I got an infinite way to go. As far as I think I might have come, there's still so much more that is still blocking the full presence of God, except in certain moments. So you know, that they, relinquishment is ongoing. And I think that's the, the work of seeking or unceasingly searching 
we know where it is already if we have moved into a contemplative stance, but there's still work to be done. Okay, Lori. So Dave, I found something for seeking, like we think of seeking as a verb that we're trying to do something. And I found it here as an adjective, asking, petitioning, wanting, calling for, requesting. So that's a whole different picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, William. So that's that's speaking to the desire that we have to continue the process. But I think the whole key is, is that once we have moved into the second half of life, once we have moved into a contemplative stance, we already know where the treasure is. Now it's a matter of what do you need to do to become more and more present to it? And so, yes, we can call it a, an unceasing search, but we have to kind of turn that around into an understanding or a concept that's more useful, I think. So is it always the, um, the fact that we know that we have, um, have him with us? Yes. Okay. Yes. We want to work towards that if we're having trouble on we with. want to work toward getting everything out of the way that would block the view of God always with us in every yeah. moment. That God's presence is within us. It's among us. It's around us. It's in our midst. It's everywhere. We're swimming in God's presence right now. Yeah. And so what's blocking us from being able to really apprehend it in the way that Brother Lawrence does, where he... He, 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 he's so full of God's presence, he can't keep his feet still. He's got happy feet, you know, and he's trying to do things to, to keep people from seeing, you know, the, 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 the gestures that he would make if, if he really let himself go. What is blocking us from that kind of experience? That's the work yet to be done. And it's all relinquishment. It's not acquisition, it's relinquishment. And what does that mean? Uh, language? Letting go. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Lori is saying this is actually part of grieving. I have so wanted what I had with Dale since being in Al Anon. Um, yeah, it is a part of grieving. What what is what is grieving really? It is accommodating a loss. So we've we've experienced a loss, and now we need to remake meaning in a new reality a new way of looking at things. And so as these things fall off, they're going to create a sense of grieving. She's talking about the loss of her husband, the loss of another person. But the loss of the parts of our identity that we've clung to for so long are also going to create a sense of grieving for us until or unless we experience this presence and then all of that is as if it's nothing, according to Brother Lawrence. Well, it goes right along with al because... In Al-Anon, it has taught me that, because uh, Dale was a workaholic. He was a workaholic and I never understood. It has a holic in it. I totally enabled him. And then his family is filled with alcoholics. And I didn't realize how that had so influenced my, you know, influenced me. But in Al-Anon, it talks about being happy with myself. And I was so identified with him. I've been with him since I was 16. So I was so identified with him. And if this has been the hardest work I've ever done in my life. And it's like, who wouldn't want the presence of God? Who doesn't want to be in the presence of God? But this relinquishment of who I was and what I had, I've been so surprised at how hard this has been to do. Darn it. You know, Frank, uh, Frank Billman, uh, our former associate pastor who retired. He always had a, a real brilliant riff that he would do um, in, in recovery, where he would make a distinction between um, wishing and willing. You know, Many people wish for this, that, and the other thing, but how many people are really willing to do what is necessary to actually achieve it, to, to get where it is they're going? <clears throat> and the interesting question you ask, who wouldn't want the presence of God? Well, stated that way, nobody, right? But who is really willing to do what is required to be fully present to God? <clears throat> Jesus talks about the narrow and the broad paths, right? 
that the, the way is narrow and the gate is constricted that leads to life and few go by that way. And then the way to, to, uh, to death or destruction is broad and many go that way. Um, C.S. Lewis talks about the gates of hell being locked from the inside. In other words, God doesn't put anybody in hell. We put ourselves in hell and we keep ourselves in hell. And then he makes this interesting statement. He says that the ghosts who are in hell, he calls them ghosts. He says, the ghosts who are in hell, it's not that they don't want to get out. It's just that they are not willing yet to do what it takes to walk out those gates. And I think that's it. Everyone would say, of course, we want the presence of God. But how many of us are willing to go through the, the, the pain of relinquishment, letting go of those pieces of our, of our supposed identity and going through the grief of that loss in order to actually have the presence? That's the key. And for most of us and many of us, life has to do a certain amount of the work for us. I mean, that's just the way it is. You know, we're going to go through an illness. How many of the mystics found God at the end of a life-threatening illness? Julian of Norwich, Francis of Assisi, so many of them went through very difficult times that stripped a lot of that away for them. And then they were able to break through. Now, to their credit, they kept the, uh, the process going after the illness and after that epiphany, after that breakthrough. They didn't just let it go. They kept working at the relinquishment. And so, uh, yeah, it's just... It's more to it than just desiring. There has to be the follow-up, the actual action, which is going to feel like little deaths as we let go of parts of ourselves that we held dear for so long. Well, wouldn't you say too, Dave, that Brother Lawrence kind of had that too because he spent with the first 10 or 15 years kind of miserable and, and he was at war earlier, a gruesome war, and so he sort of had to find his path as well, you know, through his own misery, really. You know, I think, I think if we really take a, a, a psychological dive on Brother Lawrence, if we could go back, we would find that he had PTSD. The, the 30 years war that he fought in was a, was a brutal war and it was a religious war. So not only are you seeing the atrocities and maybe partaking in some of these atrocities, they're all done in the name of God. So you got the French fighting the, the British and it's all in the name of God. And it's just this br brutal, bloody, atrocious war. And I think he came out of that deeply scarred and deeply guilty and guilt-ridden. Because you see so much of that in his writing here. You know, he, he's, he's feeling that. He's feeling he's always less than. And yet, even though he is worthy of damnation, as he would say it, God just keeps blessing him. God just keeps giving him all this great stuff that he doesn't deserve. Uh, I think, you know, if, if he were here today, we'd be sending him over to Nina for EMDR. What's he? I'm sure. I'm sure. It's a, it's a treatment for post-traumatic stress. So that's, I think that's a lot of what's going on here. But how many of us have some form of post-traumatic stress that is haunting us? that is keeping us down. See, that's also part of it. And that's very difficult to eradicate on your own because a lot of that is unconscious. How are you going to get at something that you don't even know is there? It's not conscious. Can't get your arms around it. Contemplation, though, can go there. And therapy can go there. And that's why contemplation is so important because it can take us down into those deeper places. I remember that uh, Brother Lawrence was actually a prisoner of war uh, so, I mean, that's a very stressful situation. But my understanding of the story is that his captors were impressed by his honesty and humbleness, and they they didn't, you know, just dispatch him. Um, so, so he may have had something that was impressive to his his enemies, uh, even while he was a prisoner of war. Yep. And that, that kind of parallels Francis of Assisi, who was also a prisoner of war. And uh, and that was the and then on top of that, he, he became deathly ill. So he had a twofer there. But but that's a story that you hear so many times. And, and take a look at your own story. Here you are, you know, at this point in your life, trying to dig into these deeper places. What brought you here? What was the impetus? 
Was there some really painful thing that stripped away your identity to a certain degree that puts you on the path to begin with? Certainly was for me. You know, I can't take credit for uh, getting this ball started. But once I was in that position, I knew that I needed to find some kind of meaning and purpose in life. But the, uh, the life itself and the circumstances of life are what got me a, a far patch down the road. A far piece down the road. And I think the same thing for, for Brother Lawrence happened as well. Would that be like in my uh, my my case, I guess I have to say, um, that there were so many deaths that it just really, um, it just was something that not many people have go through. Absolutely. Well, I mean, absolutely. Those and, losses, Linda, can absolutely do that. And then, so I spent a lot of time in Alcoholics Anonymous. It really helped. I, you know, and then I felt like I didn't need it anymore because I knew I'd never do it again, you know. Um, and I got here. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. But your alcoholism as well, Linda, was another defining part of your life that brought yeah. you and you know made you ready when you finally stumbled across the effect right I know. you were it's... you were ready and you were prepared to accept something different and all that loss in your life and all of that stripping away that life had had uh, brought you was part of the deal you know? yeah. there's very few of us who do this all voluntarily you know i love that line where the, 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 the man who's celebrating his 70-something birthday says, I'd like to say that I am a contemplative by intention, but in fact, I'm a contemplative by catastrophe. You know, same idea. But ultimately, it doesn't matter what horse you ride in on. Just get to the stable, all right? Yeah. Yeah. This, um, this last paragraph, is a is a is a more difficult one, and I think it, it really is speaking more about, you know, Catholic um, medieval culture, um, where he talks about um, Reverend Mother. I do not know what I shall become. It seems peace and uh, peace of soul and tranquility. Huh, easy for me to say. Peace of soul and tranquility of spirit come to me even in sleep. You know, he's always marveling at God's graciousness how it just seems to flow and, and he doesn't deserve it. And it comes so easily. He feels guilty about that because other people he looks around are working so hard at it. And, and it just seems to come to him. This, so this is a theme that recurs over and over. If I were capable of suffering, there would be none for me to have. Interesting statement, right? Um, the other translation that we're talking about, um, it, he says, it would be because I do not have any suffering. So same idea here. If I were even capable of suffering, there would be none for me to have. And, and he feels guilty about that. Because look at the, less, the rest of that sentence. If I were allowed, I would gladly submit to the sufferings of purgatory, which I would endure in reparation for my sins. The other translation, I think, is a little bit clearer. He said, I would willingly console myself with the fact there is a purgatory where I believe I will suffer to make amends for my sins. What is he basically saying here? He's saying for he doesn't believe that he has paid for the sins that he has committed in this life. He's not paying for them. He keeps trying to, you know, he keeps thinking that he's that some kind of, of real suffering is coming, something that is going to make amends for the sin. And so at death, he is still going to have to pay a price because he hasn't paid it in this life because God is so good to him all the time. You know, just keeps giving him good stuff and not the suffering that he needs to purge his sins and pay for them in the way that they think of this balancing of scales that he's going to have to spend time in purgatory in order for that to be played out. If it doesn't happen in this life, he's reasoning, it's going to have to happen in purgatory before he can finally be reconciled to God because there has to be a reckoning. Because he's looking at this as his culture does 
as Catholicism of his time did through a legal lens. There had to be a balancing of the scales in order for God to be satisfied. And he's worried that it's not coming in his lifetime. He just keeps getting more and more ecstasies, you know, more and more peace and tranquility and, and presence. And so he's worried about that. You know, Dave, when you read that, yeah, go ahead. I'm Kathy. sorry, when you read that, I kind of took it as, uh, you know, he didn't say it proudly. He, didn't, he sort of said it in a humbled way, just that it doesn't really matter. I know I'm going to suffer. I could be subjected to all kinds of suffering. I just know I'm going to be okay because God's going to have my back. In a way, he was kind of saying, it really doesn't matter what I suffer and whether I deserve it. I probably do, but God is going to take care of me in the end. I kind of looked at it that way. Like he's got an out no matter what, just because he knows. Ultimately, yes. But he still believes that there's going to have to be some kind of balancing of the scales somewhere along the line, you know? He's going he's to have to pay a price. Somehow. Yeah, he's going to have to pay the price. Is the way he's looking at. It. That's the way the uh, his 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 cultural and religious understanding of his relationship with God runs, and so he keeps expecting it in his lifetime, and it's not coming. So he says, "All right, if I die in this peace and tranquility, well, then I'm going to have to go to purgatory and work it out there." Mm -hmm. But he would say he would gladly submit to that. He doesn't really care, as as to your point, Kathy. He doesn't really care about the suffering he's going to need to do because he knows that God is with me. And the, to finish the line, right? Um, I know that God protects me. I am in a state of tranquility so sublime that I fear nothing. What could I fear when I'm with him? I hold fast to him as much as I can. May he be, be, be blessed by all. Amen. So he's got this unshakable confidence, this unshakable conviction that God has got his back, as you said, Kathy. So however this has to play out, he's okay with it. If he gets suffering in this life, okay, that's okay with him. And if he doesn't, well, then if he gets suffering in the next life to, to in purgatory to pay for his sins, that's okay with him too, because it's all going to be okay in the end. So I noticed that I felt really jealous because I've been sh struggling with nightmares all my life and had one last night, you know, just wake up, just arguing like the dream like the nightmare seems so real and uh yeah so jealous as he talks about having sweet sleeps and even in in night and and you know and then i get that that's you know well where do i go but you know i wake up calling out <laughs> you know like takes me there mm -hmm. well he went through his period of nightmares as well you know um someone alluded to the fact that his first 10 years were as he describes it, hell on earth, as he was mm -hmm. trying to in, somehow, you know, relate to and accommodate the religious life that he chose. And it was it was one of constantly, basically his first 10 years, he was trying to shove a, a square peg in a round hole. He was trying to be what everyone told him he needed to be. And he had to deal with things the way that the the, the other monks around him were dealing with them and and live by the the type of, of theological and doctrinal practice that everyone did. And it just was so crushing for him. And then this crushing guilt and, and the remorse that he brought in and the sense of his own worthlessness, which, you know, I really can say looks a lot like post-traumatic stress. But, um, but finally, he breaks through into this place of this realization of God's presence and he is transformed by it, but it was a good 10 solid years of really struggling through before he broke through. These letters we're reading after he's been in the monastery for 40 years. So he's 30 years away from that first 10 years. And so we're hearing something very different at this point, but uh, he had his nightmares, I guarantee you. So does that mean he's in his sixties? Yeah, he is. Um, what do we say? I, I I did the calculation at one point. Let me see if I can find that for you. Um, let's see. I can't find it. Yeah, he would have been in his late 50s, 68 years old in 1682. All right. And this letter is dated 
is not dated. But the next letter, the seventh letter, is dated 1688. So if he was 68, he's like 76. Did I get that right? No, 74. By the uh, around there between the sixth and the seventh letter. So he's in his early 70s by now. As much as we can tell, his birth date isn't a sure thing, but the one that seems most logical is the one that I'm going with. So yeah, late 60s, early 70s, somewhere in there. So there's been some water under the bridge in his life at this point. I like reading about that. <laughs> well, let's see. We still got about 10, 15 minutes. You want to dive into the seventh letter? Is there anything you all want to talk about with the sixth letter? Or have we mined that thoroughly? Let's go to the seventh letter then. Now this is to uh, Mrs. N. And so this is to a, a lay person. So someone different. He writes, Madam, we have a God of infinite goodness who knows what we need. I have always thought he would allow you to suffer great afflictions. Oh, thanks so very much, huh? He will come in his own good time and when you least expect it. Hope in him more than ever. Thank him with me for the graces he has granted you, particularly for the fortitude and patience he is giving you in your afflictions. It is a sure sign of his care for you. Take comfort then in him and thank him for everything. Okay, this sounds pretty perverse when you first hit that sentence, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. I've always thought he would allow you to suffer with great afflictions. All right. But now let's think of this in light of what we were just talking about. He believes that there has to be recompense for sin, right? And that the sin and the suffering brings us closer to God, either theologically or just in terms of presence. He had to go through his own suffering to finally break through to God's presence. He sees this as a gift. And that's the thing that, that's difficult for us to understand. We don't know anything about the relationship. We don't know who this woman is. But we know that she is now suffering something very severe. And what he's actually doing, even though it sounds like a slap in the face, insult to injury, <clears throat> he is trying to turn this around for her. He always thought, it's, there's almost like a bit of envy there, you know, because he hasn't gotten the great afflictions in his life that he thinks is going to finally even the, the scales of justice for him. And so he always thought that that was going to be there for her, this gift from God as he sees it. And God will come in his own good time, or in the other translation, God will come when it feels right to him and when you least expect it. So I don't know if he's talking here about her death, that God will take her away from all these afflictions in death, or in just the simple presence that he broke through into. So Maybe it is that she is struggling through these afflictions and she's trying to find God's presence and they've been counseling or talking together about that. And she's starting to despair that it's just never going to happen. I mean, how many of us have felt that way? You know, we're trying to find God. We're trying to connect with God and it just feels like it's never going to happen. And maybe she's starting to lose faith, lose hope that it's ever going to break through for her the way that Brother Lawrence describes it has for him. But God will come in his own good time. God will come when it feels right and when you least expect it. Hope in him more than ever. Thank him with me for the graces he has granted you, particularly for the fortitude and patience he has given you in your afflictions. It's a sure sign of his care for you. Take comfort then in him and thank him for everything. So cast back in that sort of light, it makes more sense as a, is actually a loving response to um, the pain and the, the suffering that this woman is going through. Well, this goes right along. I'm working on the second step that I've come to believe that power greater than myself can help me through my insanity, which is whatever. And I was just talking to one of my wise friends just today. This message I feel is so for me. Um, we were talking about the adversity that I've been going through in, in the recent time. And 
she read to me from survival in an alcoholic home. And this is exactly what it talked about was that in my worst moments to have gratitude for the things that God has done. And that when I have that gratitude, then it opens up a whole new mindset and uh, a possibility of inspiration to keep me going forward, to let go, because he talks about letting go of fear. And so we were talking about letting go of fear and regret and shame for me, mm -hmm. you know, and it all goes along with when having gratitude of how I wouldn't have thought how gratitude moves me forward, but it does. Okay. So here's the, the $64,000 question. How do you get gratitude? from other can you can you just decide that you're going to be grateful can you just stand in front of a mirror and count your blessings is that how we get gratitude are you asking me specifically i'm asking the, the whole the, room the the the, uh, the entire the entire 11 of us <laughs> by the way we lost uh, um uh, william had to go he texted me to say he that he had to leave so he he said goodbye in text wow. <laughs> I, I just ask myself the question, what do I, what do you feel grateful for today? And usually something pops up mm -hmm. and I, I feel better after, you know, my, I don't, my consciousness answers that question. Okay. I've been trying to write because I've been so good for the past five years about writing, you know, in my journal, but I've really been wanting to, because I'm telling you, running the business without my husband has been a miracle because I never ran a business before and it's multi-million dollar business. And so what I've been trying to remember to do was not just write about the bad stuff, write about the good stuff so that when I hit the depths of despair, as Anne of Green Gables would say, I've just hit the depths of despair. If I go back and I look, okay, and he blessed me here and he blessed me here, then I'm not feeling so alone. Okay. Uh, another strategy is just to uh, show greater appreciation for the, let's say you have nothing, right? No business, no house. Uh, you are just this homeless guy on the bank of a river. You could still feel grateful that you are alive. Um, you know, it, it could be, you know, just grateful that you have your senses and you can uh, appreciate be, being here. That might be enough. Okay. I was a little thrown off by the question of how you get gratitude because first thing at Carol Community is you don't get it, you give it. So to give thanks, doesn't matter where I'm at or when I'm, I'm seeing, I'm breathing, I'm being given this beauty all around me, the sky, the trees, the you know, if we kept giving thanks, we wouldn't have time for anything else. <laughs> I like that. That's 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 great. Gratitude is a choice. When you go through your challenges and the things we face along life's journey, I can't tell you how many times I'm faced with something and based on my choice really dictates what kind of day or week or month or year I'm going to have. So I try and as often as possible choose to be grateful for the things that I experience in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're muted, Kathy. I was just going to say, I think it's a balance too between, you know, our expectations in life and, and I guess having just come off of the whole Richard Rohr book, you know, seeing how so many expectations we had as we were growing up and as we were in our ambitious years of life and, and you kind of get to a point where it's you do have more gratitude. I think it kind of grows and then maybe you realize it. Um, I like that idea Marina said about just giving it away. I mean, some of some of that comes as well. But but then I think of younger people that have had tragedies in their lives and you see them turn their lives around and you see them with gratitude, just filled with gratitude through, you know, some tragic accident they have and now they can't walk anymore and their whole life has changed before them. It's almost like they've grown up immediately and gotten this gratitude. It's it's amazing. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure they have to go through rough times to get there. They have to go through the anger, denial, bargaining, and all the other things that you have to do to get there. But it's just something about that balance between expectations and then just being grateful for what you have and not expecting all this stuff that we were expecting maybe the first half of our life. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great. Patricia, are you still with us? Patricia? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> Can you comment on gratitude for us? For me, it's my thoughts create my emotions. So it's just, if I don't have gratitude, it's just changing my focus, changing my thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Scott said, it's a choice. Mm-hmm. And it's also realizing trust is part of it for me. Realizing that I don't have the big picture. And uh, that's okay, you know, but it's, it's, it's just trust that, that God is always there. And knowing he's always there, it's only me that can separate myself, that, mm-hmm. that can create that separation. Good stuff. Who else haven't we heard from? Bill and Gail? You want to jump in here at all? I'm kind of going through a time where I'm trying to sort through how much I've been trying to program myself to think right, to just make the choices that I've made and whether they've been driven by me or whether they're really God's presence that's speaking into me. And I'm (laughs) I'm not testing God right now, but I'm feeling like I'm letting go of a lot of stuff and just seeing where this awareness can come from or not and what's causing it is it just me talking myself into it telling myself how i'm supposed to be thinking or is it really happening in my experience and so i'm kind of in that middle of that wandering in a sense Mm. are you feeling particularly grateful at the moment (laughs) um in some regards yeah good uh, you know, it's another, uh, it, it just, I'm um, at a time in my life where I'm uh, trying to adjust to the changes that are a part of kind of setting your spurs aside for a W-2 income and just seeing where God's wanting, where life takes me. Yeah. And whether God's really not, you know, I'm chewing, I've been chewing again on the, um, accepting life on life's terms and how much is it really depending just on me and how much is God in the midst of it shaping and inspiring me or not. So I'm, you know, testing, questioning (laughs) all the past programming a little bit. For myself, um, I think the thought comes to mind of this family we just heard from again in a letter we get every now and then and they have two um daughters that qualify for make a wish foundation and she always ends her letters with choosing joy you know um susie choosing joy susie and she really does need to choose joy because she has much that you know could go the other direction and I have adopted that for myself that it is my choice and even in those days when um I'm heading south not a good place (laughs) I uh in order to come out uh I have to I I do choose joy I choose something that to be grateful for and it does make a difference yeah very good Vaughn are you there you want to chime in buddy yeah I'm here just so many thoughts going through my mind as a clinician I found myself looking at patients who are unique in every way they sometimes were depressive more than looking so it depends I think many times on the person's nature of things so if their nature is depressive they tend toward that if they're more open and more tending toward that but in all situations no matter what it is um 
having a gratitude list, for example, is a simple tool. Works most for many people. Maybe making a list of those things they're grateful for. It comes out of Al-Anon too. Many things come out of Al- these uh, self-help groups, which are helpful for all who work through things in life which are trouble troubling and again for all of us it's different so for emotionally but also different physically people have different struggles in life so the ease of it may be different for those who have more profound struggles but the fact is that we all have to face them ourselves so and ptsd is very real you've, you've, you've seen dave and seeing things like that they've been through things that might have affected their so their inner being so that changes this was more complicated than simply being grateful just to cheer up some, some, some words like cheer up come on get over it like that's hard to do so that's my thought yeah i think if someone just t- tells you to cheer up and be grateful it's kind of like when someone tells you just snap out of it and yeah. you, you, have, you have my permission to slap them right across the face <laughs> exactly that's, that's so completely nope. unhelpful you know for me that was my right that was my recommendation to talk to the patient too. Yeah, do that. All right. <laughs> Dave, Dave, me, one last comment. On okay, that. go ahead, Bill. One last comment is that when I hear that of, uh, I don't hear come get over it, but I remember my dad saying just a simple word of keep your chin up. And the only reason that really has credibility when I look at what he endured through his life, that teaches me that just just be conscious of myself keeping maybe it's maybe it's my face toward god instead of just being downcast and just Mm -hmm. feeling no presence just the awareness of lifting my chin has been kind of a simple thing that from my dad i take as a i don't know it's in my it's in my root somewhere but you know what? I think you're making a real important distinction. There's a big difference between keep your chin up and snap out of it. Right, keep, yeah, keep, I agree. Keep your chin up is kind of like Winston Churchill saying, when you're going through hell, keep going, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah you it's, it's somebody that has demonstrated that by what they've endured and come through mm-hmm. in their life. It has credibility as opposed to hollow, empty, motivational speakers, whatever you want to. It comes with credibility when you know that that person is endured and lived through and kept going through hell and they've kept going it's pretty amazing and so that's a very different message yeah to keep showing up is the message that we do need it doesn't mean that we're going to feel different but if we keep showing up we eventually will move into a different space because for me gratitude is more of a byproduct it's not something that you go after directly Actually, I think of gratitude as the felt experience of God's presence. When we've gotten everything else out of the way, that's why I think, you know, you know, choose joy means that you're clearing out all of the egoic things that are keeping you rooted in this place of misery. And, and even what John was saying, you know, about how he uses certain techniques or Vaughn was saying, I think all of those really what they're doing is they're getting our own headspace out of the way. So we can just be here now and present. And what that feels like is grat- is what we call gratitude. Um, and so, again, just one thing we need to do. If we keep showing up, if we keep our chin up and keep showing up to practice presence, the result of that is going to be gratitude. Not 100% of the time, but we're going to have these moments and these waves of it. And it'll alternate and oscillate. But more and more... You know, eventually we're going to hit that 51% mark and we've recharacterized ourselves as a grateful person, a person who spends most of his or her time in God's presence and understands that consciously what that means. And that that changes everything. Mm-hmm. However you understand it, yes, when you have hit gratitude, you're there. That's the feeling. That's what it feels like to be in the presence of God. And so... Uh, that, that should be our holy grail, as long as we're not trying to do it directly, I think. But uh, everyone's going to have a different take on this in a different way there. And if you're getting there, like I said, it doesn't matter what horse you ride in on, just get to the stable, okay? <laughs> All right, let's leave it there. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's time for East Coast people to go to bed. And uh, Scotty, let's turn it over to you.
Father God, we're so grateful to be here with each other and with you and studying these concepts and ideas and all an endeavor to understand you more completely. And that's a never ending journey. But one thing's for sure, when we place our eyes on you, we can see love. So we're grateful, Father, for how you love us. We pray and we give our thanks and we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 All Marina, right. I love your dog. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. That's yeah, good. Thank you. He he loves you too. He, he's just all about like, I'm here, you know, where's the party? Let's let's go. <laughs> Yeah, it just loves to connect with people. Uh, <laughs> We're a dog group here, so. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's a cutie. Marina, it was a pleasure to have you with us. We hope we'll see you again. Thank you. All right. You. Good night, everybody. Good see night. you on Sunday. 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 Good night. Bye, Kathy. Thank you, Dee. Good night, uh, Linda. Good night, Jor Jordana. And you be safe up there. Okay, up okay. north. Well, I'm going to be straining on Sunday, so. Fantastic. So you'll see us, let, but we won't see you. Yeah, let Mary, let Mary we'll, know that she we'll, could we'll say do something. A, we'll do a shout out to you and Vernon and, and your mom. How's that? Okay, thank you, Dave. All right, you guys. See you soon. Bye, Linda. Bye.